<laughs> yeah, let's do this. <laughs> oh, I'm excited well. than you are, B. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> What's up, everyone? Welcome to the after party for the last doc, last dance doc, where we recap each one of Sunday's episodes. I'm Mackenzie Salmon with three-time NBA champ BJ Armstrong, brought to us by Mitchell and Ness. If you guys want to go get some cool gear like a jersey, definitely go check them out. I saw they had some really cool MJ stuff on there. Um, but yeah, I guess with the help of the internet and everyone peer pressuring ESPN, we finally got the first two episodes of the 10 part series. Um, for this talk, I definitely, we're going to, I know, uh, break this up into different topics. We're going to talk about the Bulls, the, the cultural impact the Bulls had, um, and a few other different things. But before diving into the doc, I do want to point out the fact, I know we talked about this before, BJ, but I think this is the first time the, in a while that the sports world has really united for an event, and it was a look back at the 90s Bulls dynasty. <laughs> yes, it was. It was certainly a, a global event, if you will, and um, we've all kind of been sitting around with no sports to entertain us, and suddenly yeah. <laughs> we have been reunited with one of our heroes, right? Michael Jordan. Uh, there's a lot of questions about those teams. How did it all happen? And uh, it was a lot of fun. And and the big thing, and the thing that I found most interesting, right, is how the younger generation, right, um, were all yeah. interested to say how how good it was this guy for real. So it was yeah. a great start, <laughs> and uh, it, it was uh, I thought it was very well done. Yeah, and I want to ask you from your perspective. I mean, how well did they depict? the the 90s bulls from these first two episodes that we saw well i think what they did uh i think that what you know they tried to accomplish is to really establish um the characters that were involved in this process and i thought you know it was michael's mom his dad his brothers uh and the people that played such a pivotal part in his life especially early on about you know how he became you know the player and the person, you know, I thought Dean Smith's uh, part in the series early on was great. And then he, they moved around a little bit. And then you saw some of the early players, some of the early MJ, which was fabulous to watch him play against in that Boston series. And um, so they kind of moved around a little bit. The the Bulls, you know, whether it was Jerry Reinsdorf, Jerry Krause, I thought that was that was great. So um, I thought it was a great introduction to the characters that we're going to have to kind of get an overall picture of, you know, who this Michael Jordan guy really was. Yeah. And I think something that not a lot of people, I know for me, I didn't necessarily think of when I think of MJ, it was him getting on his teammates at that one part, kind of criticizing them, like, <laughs> guys, get, get, to, get, you know, get going. Was that on point or was there more missing from that? Because I'm sure there were some things that were said that that didn't make the doc. Well, <laughs> Let's say this. If that is the <laughs> if that's all you saw, then you just saw the PG version. Right. Oh, really? uh, yeah. That was nothing. That was like, you know, some Bob Knight stuff or like <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it gets pretty heated. But, you know, that's part of professional sports. And um, I think as we get more involved into the into the documentary, I'm I'm probably. I'm just going to predict that it will probably get you'll see more and more of his true personality come out. Um, yeah. But if I, if that was it, I was like, wow, I, you know, I could have done that one. Right. I could have I could have said those things. But he was we was fearless. And uh, and I would imagine as you know, you, you begin to see how, you know, he developed into, you know, his first championship, second championship, you'll see his true character and true raw emotions begin to evolve and really come out in the in this docuseries. And watching this too, before we get into, um, I do want to go into Jerry Krause a little bit. I think one of, that was one of the big themes that these two episodes focused on. But uh, before that, I mentioned to you earlier too, that I wasn't born until 1995. So seeing, <laughs> seeing some of this, and I mean, arguably one of the greatest se Jordan seasons was the 90, 91 season. And that was before my time, but, right. but watching this, you know, growing up Jordan and that Bulls team was, was basketball to me and seeing kids now watch this documentary. I mean, how is revisiting this kind of, 
I guess, surreal to you in a sense, seeing, seeing all this stuff happen again and how it's shaped the culture today. Well, what's really, really weird. It's really weird to see something that you actually lived in you, you know, yeah. you were kind of there. So it's, this is kind of awkward to talk about. Oh yeah. I remember that. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. But the one thing back then, Mackenzie, I can say is that um, as a young kid, you know, we were the kids who had the dream, right? So I was living yeah. my dream and as kids were watching me and I was inspiring other kids, I was actually the one kid who had an opportunity and I was humbled to be in that situation. So I had no mm -hmm. idea uh, of the impact I was making. I had no idea that he was going to be go on to be the greatest player. I knew he was really good. I didn't know he was going to yeah. be the greatest player. I had no idea that, you know, that the Jordan shoes were going to be this cultural <laughs> phenomenon. If so, I would have, I would have made sure that every day I would, have, I would have got some of those <laughs> shoes. Right. Uh, we just had no idea. We were just all young men trying to figure yeah. out our identity and who we could be in this league. And uh, it's fun to look back on it now because you said you could have, would have, should have, um, but the key is we were all young. We were all dedicated to our craft. We were all dedicated to trying to be the best, but certainly none of us could have predicted that we would win one championship, let alone in the end, you know, watching Michael and Scotty win six championships. Yeah. And going into the, I think some of the, the big topics um, that this doc focused on was the importance of Pippen to MJ and, and how Jerry Krause kind of got, how he impacted the team. So I do want to start with Jerry. Um, I think this doc obviously focus on the demise of Jerry and his relationship with the team and Pippen. But at the time when you got there, the team was really blossoming and you guys were just getting your feet wet for what the dynasty would become. Right. So I, I kind of want to take, have you take me through um, that timeline when you got to the team in 89, what was that relationship like between Jerry and uh, Phil Jackson? Well, when I got there in 1980, 1989, that was Phil Jackson's very first year in the nba so he was oh i didn't know that okay yeah as a head coach so we got there the exact same year so his rookie season as a head coach was my rookie season uh in the nba so we both started off as rookies together and uh he was taking over a very good team um led by michael jordan there was a young player that we all saw his physical capability scotty pippen but he wasn't that scotty pippen yet that we've come to know as one of the top 50 um players of all time so um we all came in together and like i said we had no idea of what we could accomplish we all dreamed about it we all thought that there was some potential here we had some great veterans and great veteran leadership with bill cartwright and hear me I don't know what's going on here okay i hear you now <laughs> yeah the one thing sorry about that the one thing that i can say when i came into this when i came into the bulls uh organization yeah. is that it was all business right that was apparent oh, right when we came in there was no you know let's develop let's figure out who we're going to be we came in with okay everyone has a, a job everyone has to play their role but more importantly you got to perform so it was a very it was a sense of urgency I learned that the first day on the job, uh, our practices were very focused. We were straight to the point and, um, you know, we had a job to do and, and that's what, it was just business as usual. And that's how I kind of came into the league as a young player in 1989. Was that the player's perceptions of Jerry when you first got there? Was it was just strictly business pretty much? Well, I, I, I'll say this about Jerry Cross. Jerry Cross um, was a general manager that I, when I knew, right, he had, you know, he didn't draft Michael Jordan, but he was he yeah. should get the credit for putting everyone else around. Right. He won, he was the one I think they mentioned it in the documentary. He made the trade for Charles Oakley. I mean, for Bill Cartwright with Charles Oakley. He drafted Scottie Pippen and Horace Grant. He acquired or, or figured out how to put the pieces that were necessary for Michael Jordan's talent to really blossom. This was a team that was built around size and length you know scotty pippen was six eight six nine very athletic he was 
very complimentary of what Michael did. You had Horace Grant. We had a big Bill Cartwright who didn't demand the ball uh, in the post. We had John Paxson, myself. We had shooters to space the floor. So you got to give Jerry Krause credit. It was this team was constructed with the idea we had a chance and if we all did our job. We could live with the results and uh, we won and, and we were able to move on and do it, you know, three, you know, really create two three peats is what eventually the, uh, we were able to do up there. Yeah. And during that first three peat, were there any cracks in the relationship with Jerry and the team or was there a moment when you saw things kind of turn more sinister? Well, you know, much is written. And back then, <laughs> Mackenzie, you know, unlike today, we have the Internet. We are here social chatting media, social yeah. media. <laughs> Believe it or not, we used to deal with the newspapers, right? <laughs> and uh, and so one of the things that was always sacred with the team, the good teams from the great team, was you never allow things that were happening outside of the locker room to enter into the locker room. And that was an idea that was very prevalent with great teams. So we never allow anything that was going on to really – you know, have anything that would affect the outcome of the game that yeah. we were playing in. So were there things going around? Yes. But the one thing is you can tell with, you know, hopefully you could see a little bit of it here and it probably will be amplified more as we go through. Nothing mattered to us as a group, right? We were able to function in the chaos, right? That was kind of our core, who we were as a, as a team. Like, yeah. We could play in chaos and more chaos that was going on around us, the, the better. better we the better <laughs> we were, right? Like, like we needed that. Like that was kind of our inner strength as a group. That's what brought us together. And um, so where most people talk about the drama and the chaos affecting their group, for, for whatever reason, with our team, it brought us more and closer together and we needed it. And uh, so what was ever, whatever was going on outside of those lines really didn't matter to us because once yeah. we got in, that's where we all felt most comfortable. Yeah, I think from my perspective too, watching this doc, it was easy to somewhat hate on Jerry from what it was showing. Cause you've got Pippen who was obviously not happy with the situation. Jordan just wanted to win. And then you've got a coach in the middle of all this, how much, of the feud was actually just the contract and how much was just their relationship in general as far as like the business aspect? Well, I, I think when you have a, a team that is as interesting as ours um, or <laughs> the interest that, I mean, it was really a lot of characters, right? So you had this young, sure. amazing player who was like transcending the league. And then you had Scotty Pippen, this emerging star. And then you had, you know, a great city like Chicago. We had the, you know, the Detroit Pistons. You had all of these things that was going on at this time. You know, you had the emergence of television and cable television. So there were a lot of things going on. And, um, but you know what? <laughs> to us, it really didn't matter. <laughs> and, I, you know, there, there, there was, you know, there was this Air Jordan character that we all knew. We all were aware of. Michael was aware of yeah. it. But to us, he was just MJ. We all hang out together. We all played cards together. We all did things. Played cards. I we, love uh, that. We played cards. <laughs> we did things. And this was before cell phones. So we actually talked to each other on the bus. We talked to each other yeah. on the plane. Uh, there was a <laughs> lot of jokes. And it was just a different time. And, um, you know, Michael respected being a great teammate. And, uh, yeah. you know, he's, he, was, like, he was a phenomenal player and all those things but he was one of the guys and that's yeah. what we all knew. And that's why we were all comfortable and we could say things to each other because we were really comfortable with each other in that way of knowing that if we were going to be the best, we had yeah. to tell each other's truth to one another and not be afraid to do that if we were going to try to win. And, and we were, we eventually got to that point and, and uh, you know, there was nothing he couldn't say. I couldn't say it to him, but it wasn't personal. It was just, business. Gotcha. We understood it. It was our relationship. We Our relationship was strong enough that we had to talk to each other if we were going to be in these uncomfortable situations. No social media back then. So no social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was none of, none of that. And, <laughs> and, and the key was, you know, this was before social media. So the locker room was the sacred place. That was the sacred home. That was the safe zone for everyone for all of the yeah. players. So no matter what was going on, something said something in an article, a guy was going to get traded, you know, rumors were here, 
when you were in the locker room, you really had that bond. And that was the respected area for everyone, right? That was our holy ground. And everyone kind of, you know, adhered to those rules. And that was the time yeah. and era when the locker room was really the place where everyone knew that they could uh, be safe in. And that was our safe haven. Yeah. And going off the, uh, you know, the me social media thing, I do want to touch on, um, Jerry Krause being misquoted, uh, it, one part in the doc where it said that he had said organizations win championships, not players, to which he was originally said as players and coaches alone don't win, something to that regard. Right. I, regardless of being misquoted or not, I wanted to ask you from your perspective as a player, what did you take away from that statement? I mean, because like they're not the ones going out there putting on you know the jerseys and playing. That must have struck something. Well, you, you know, um... Back then when it was said, you know, you you understood where you kind of fell into this to this business. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, that I really am very appreciative is that I had not good veteran leadership. I had phenomenal veteran leadership. Right. And that was a quote that was really a, a, a hot topic. Right. Um, around the city of Chicago, around the NBA and the circles. And certainly it, it, it was, it could be inflamed to where people could take it out of context. But I understood, I think, what was trying to be conveyed. It might have not been the best choice of words. It might not have been the, the right thing to say in the moment. Um, but I certainly understood it, right? I understood the relationship that was necessary if you were going to win. And make no doubt about it, right? The players have a job to do, the coaches have a job to do, the executives have a job to do, and the ownership, right? So there are four people that sit at the at the table of excellence, right? So you have to have a yeah. great owner, you have to have terrific executives, you have to have the coaches and the players. And if all four of those, you know, people sitting at the table, if they're all, if if one or if any of them aren't on the same page as the other, you have no chance to win in this league. So I understood what was being said, but I also understood how it could be mis, you know, misread or in this yeah. case, misinterpreted what he was trying to say. Every organization, every player will, will tell you and share with you to say the same thing. Everyone has to be ready to work with one another. It's a partnership. Yeah. Make no doubt about it. I understood it, uh, but certainly it was one of those things that was well talked about. And certainly 30 something years later, we're still talking about it. But I understood what was trying to be conveyed at that at that time in that moment. Yeah. And I do want to talk, um, talk, touch on Scottie Pippen, because I think that was one of the, the big themes in, in the two episodes. You were only one of a handful of guys who played on the team without Michael, but with Pippen um, during that stint of him playing baseball. In the documentary, MJ mentioned recognizing the importance of Scotty. What was that relationship like when you first got there in 89 between the two guys? Well, you know, the one of the joys that I've had playing in this league and, 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 and you know, because I've had I, I was lucky. Right. I was playing with with, with great players yeah. is I saw the emergence of Scotty Pippen and I saw Scotty Pippen emerge from a player who was trying to figure out who he was going to be, how he was going to achieve it to perhaps one of the top five or 10 players to ever play at his position. And to see a young man go through that transition from being a young kid from Arkansas to coming off the bench in the NBA to suddenly maybe not being the best player that he could be in the playoffs to all of a sudden now being yeah. one of the primary players, that was one of the highlights of my career because I saw him put in the work, make no yeah. doubt about it. Scotty Pippen was incredibly gifted as a basketball player. Um, I, I enjoyed watching him because Scotty Pippen could play the game in a way that the rest of us couldn't, right? He could affect the game and yeah. didn't have to score. He would, he could dribble, he could pass, he could defend, he could shoot a little bit. He could, you know, he could do all these things that would contribute to our success. And uh, it was fun to watch him emerge as a player. And the, the thing that I have to give the coaches credit and, and the organization credit was Scottie Pippen was the perfect compliment, compliment or complimentary player to Michael Jordan because Michael yeah. Jordan's greatest asset was his versatility. I can't think yeah. of a, a player that is just as versatile that can play with Michael Jordan 
than Scottie Pippen. Because, and Scottie Pippen wasn't like a primary scorer. I mean, he would get 20 yeah. points in the flow of the game. And um, he was he was a great teammate. And I think it was Steve Kerr who said it. Scottie Pippen was really kind of the glue because he was yeah. he could do a little bit of everything on the team. And he was a very unique player for his time. And once you guys started winning championships, did you see his his attitude sort of changed? And, and did he make it obvious to you guys that he felt undervalued in that first three feet? Well, I think what what was Scotty, um, you know, I think what Scotty was going through was, you know, Scotty Pippen wasn't like the traditional role to the NBA, right? He wasn't like a yeah. McDonald's All American. He wasn't highly recruited. Scotty Pippen was a self made player, right? I yeah. mean, That's what a crazy. story! What a story! I mean, he's he's a what I think they yeah. said he was like a ball boy or something at, at Central or, or something like, like that. <laughs> and then you, you got a young kid who's like six feet. You know he's a you know he's a, he's the he's you know he's he's just helping the team and then suddenly and a year or two later he's like five inches and he's the star player and suddenly he's like the fourth or fifth pick in the draft so his role was you know very unconventional if you will to get to the NBA and I I and I know you know playing in that league you're constantly trying to prove yourself so Scottie Pippen was constantly proving himself that not only did he belong but that he was here that he had arrived and I get it. Right. I, and, and, and it's good to play with that chip on your shoulder. It's good that to have that and to watch Scotty accept that challenge. I mean, that was a, that's an amazing accomplishment. Well, how many players could actually go through that role to be an NBA player? And Scotty did it and he yeah. did it better than anyone. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I was always happy for him t- uh, to watch him, because you know what? He he really had to earn his stripes. He really had to earn everything that he accomplished. And uh, he did a he did a phenomenal job. Yeah. Well, last last question I, I personally have for you. I think we might take a few fan questions here at the end. But uh, I think the doc is setting it up really well to have an episode just based on Phil Jackson. Because I feel like, in a sense, he was kind of the glue that was holding the team together. Because you had MJ that... <laughs> that was said he was only going to play for him, Jerry. That only signed, let him do the one-year contract extension. So, I want your prediction for where the doc is going next. Where do you see these next episodes going? Well, I, I think we have to dive, take a deep dive into the mindset of how Jordan really understood not only his individual greatness but the greatness yeah. of a team. And you have to start with the Detroit Pistons, right? The Detroit Pistons were a very tough-minded group. Um, mm-hmm. They were w- disciplined. They had great players. They had Hall of Fame players. They had a Hall of Fame coach. And I think if we're going to find out who prepared Michael Jordan for this level of greatness that we're talking about, that we've come to say yeah. MJ, we have to start there. So I think the documentary has to go there. I think it has to you know, really look at like why did Michael Jordan have this level of passion, right? You had a, yeah. you know, as you, as I was watching, I was thinking what will allow a person to live at such extremes, right? On one hand, he was so accomplished individually, but on the other hand, what will allow you to play with this much drive and insecurity that he felt a need every single time he got on the floor that he had to prove himself over and over again. So he was comfortable being uncomfortable at both extremes. On one hand, he was great. But on the other hand, you can see whether it was practice, the games or whatever, he had this idea or insecurity within himself that I have to prove myself over and over again. And he talked about it, which I found, you know, kind of funny (laughs) because it reminded me of so much. He didn't even want you to think that you could beat him. So he was always aware. He was always yeah. playing these mental games to say, you know what? I don't even want the L.A. Clippers to think they can beat me. Right. I don't even want yeah. to give you the confidence to even that thought to enter in your mind. So his mental capacity, mental toughness and all of the things that he did, it was just fascinating. And uh, and it's it's funny now to watch uh, <laughs> now that I'm over 50. I'm going. <laughs> we were all a little crazy back then. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I loved it. I like how you mentioned that too, because there were some parts where you could tell it, he was like, if "There's one thing I'm not gonna lose." And his dad even mentioning, like, "Don't tell him he can't do something because he will." He oh, will yeah, 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 yeah. oh for, <laughs> for sure. You know, that guy was not gonna lose. That's for sure. You know, he was, he was, uh, he's a little different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I think we have a, a fan question or something okay. that um, someone wrote in. They will was, I think that's how you pronounce the last part. They said, what were the pregame rituals before the big playoff games? And what kind of music did you guys listen to in the locker room? I love this question. I said we had uh, to ask it. Yeah, you know, uh, again, okay, I'm, I'm going back you to touched like on the, the soundtrack. Yeah, I, I, the soundtrack was great. <laughs> we'll get to the soundtrack. But the pregame rituals, you know, we we had this thing as a group, and I I don't know how it started, I don't know why it started, but before the game, we all had this respect for each other's silence. I can't tell you why it was that way, right? It was like complete silence. Um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't any music. Music was off limits in our locker room, right? Um, we had a community. Wow. We had a community space, and and I think now that I think back on it, I think that probably all started from field. So there was the individual space that we had, and then we had this communal space, and we always respected each other's community space. So gotcha. it was a respect factor, right? Of saying we had all people's, you know, different people from different backgrounds within our locker room. You know, I remember Phil would come by with the sage. He was always blessing Sage, the stage. I love <laughs> he, he would come by with all these candles, and we'd be like, "Oh God, what is going on here?" But it was always the <laughs> it was always that locker room, or when you know, one of the things that I I I I've, I cherished was before every practice, mm -hmm. Phil Jackson would always bring everyone into the group because he wanted everyone to feel in part of this community that we all cherished and that we all had to preserve. So the locker room, there was no music, there was anything, we sat in the silence. Now, after the game, it was, you know, all bets are off. But before Everything the game, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. But before the game, and and I remember it was, we did that on the bus, going to the games on the road, and, and, and in particular at home, there was nothing that was gonna be said other than we had to direct all of our energies you know, to, to winning that game. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. So briefly, right before we go do, I want to ask you about that soundtrack. Cause you, oh, <laughs> you said, oh, now, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, you know, I, I was watching I loved it. and when I heard, <laughs> when I heard Rock Kim, <laughs> when I heard Rock Kim, come on, I, now you're talking to me, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, I started doing my thing. I felt like rejuvenated. I was like, "Get me the uniform!" You know, I was so fired up about the music. And then when I heard LL Cool J, I'm bad. I was like, "No, that's my era, right? That's now you're talking to the young, vibrant, the good uh, hip -hop. yeah, good hip hop." Uh, LL, I mean, when I heard Rock Kim. Right, you know, <laughs> I ain't no joke. I was like, now you're talking to me. Now I, I felt That's good hilarious. for about five minutes, and then I was like, oh, my shoulders hurt. I, I can't do it. <laughs> but the music was fantastic. Like, give me more of the music. Give me more of that I music. I can't wait. I know. <laughs> I, I was so fired up about the music. I can't tell you. That is hilarious. I can't wait for the next the the next few episodes. What kind of music they have? Because when it started playing, I was kind of like, oh. Hey, all right. Some good old no. like, you were like, that's think, back in the, you were like, that's back in the day. I was like, that was my day. That was my day. <laughs> you know, I was ready to get my cane. My, my wife and I, we were like, I was trying to find my Kango, my LL Kango, you know, <laughs> you know, I was trying to find all my stuff. You know? I was really excited about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. No, this has been so much fun. I, uh, again, appreciate your time and thank you everyone who's joined us today on this first episode. Uh, we will be back next Monday to talk about the third and fourth episode. So be sure to keep sending in questions and comments you have for us. Uh, we'll hopefully put them up here if you have some good ones, but until next time, stay safe and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. See ya. <laughs>